pretty close. It is. It's our little ritual here at the beginning. We say, are we on? Are we live? I don't know. We go on our phone. This is where Dave we said we need intro music. <laughs> we do need we intro are music. Live. We are live now. We show it, show it on here. So, All right. Let's yeah, a little bumper on. music, you know, a little crank it up. Yeah, I think I think that would be good. I think that would be good. Well, here we are. We are on Season 2, Episode 6, Boating Tips Live with Marine Max, of course. I don't know if you're watching us live on YouTube, watching us live on Facebook, but here we are. I'm Captain Nick Pavlakis with Marine Max in St. Pete. And, of course, the most recognizable face in the boating industry, at least on the west coast of Florida, Captain Keith Lake from Marine <laughs> Max Clearwater. How are you, Captain up, Keith? Doing great, Nick. And How are you? Have, I'm doing good. And we have a... Huge guest today. We have Dave Biggie with the VP of Marine Max Vacations, and we're talking about all things catamaran versus monohull. It's a popular topic in the world of boats. So, Dave, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we're looking forward to today's episode. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. This is great. Glad to have you here. We're looking forward to it. So, Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive right in and uh, start answering all those questions that are going to come rolling in. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. So um, I spent a lifetime in the boating industry and uh, in my early years in high school, I was racing sailboats, which moved to racing catamarans. Uh, and I've been in the boat business ever since then. So being in the Midwest for many, many years, uh, and I've been with Marine Max for 25 years. So I've had an opportunity to do a lot of things with the company and be part of the growth in so many different areas that it's been a, a great career and it's allowed me to do what I love and earn a living and raise a family in some wonderful places. So I'm glad to be here and, and continue to be part of the team and the growth because the company just continues to move forward with vision and, uh, and goals that are exciting. So historically Marine Max, when everybody thinks Marine Max, you know, they think of, you know, the, uh, a boat retailer, everybody knows, you know, you come in, you buy a boat, Captain Keith is going to show you how to use it all that fun stuff. But really quick, let's talk about Marine Max Vacations for a minute and, and exactly what it is and, and what you guys provide. So that's a great question. And it's really a great example of how our company has looked to the boating community and said, how can we, pro how can we provide more? How can we be more of an asset or a resource to the boating public? And with our stores, we are so good at educating and showing people how to use their boats safely, how to have fun, how to introduce friends and family to the boating lifestyle that at a local level and even regional level, we expand people's horizons in boating. Well, Marine Max Vacations is simply an extension of that, but it's sort of on steroids in the sense that we said, hey, how can we take somebody that's in Ohio or maybe in, in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Florida, somebody that, that may be local, that has visions and, and aspirations of doing something more, something bigger in their boating. And so we developed the concept of Marine Max Vacations, which can be a, a bare boat where you pilot it yourself or a fully crewed yacht, which is a very luxury experience. And we took that into the Caribbean and we were able to bring customers from all of these local stores and regions down to the Caribbean for a, an experience of blue water boating. We are located in the BVI, that's our main base. And from that location, we have access to over 60 islands in the chain around Tortola, which is the main island in the BVI. And this is a phenomenal boating destination because it's deep water, easy navigation, lots of coves, lots of places to moor with mooring balls, which removes the, the need for anchoring. The, the community, is in, it, it embraces charter guests. Uh, there are restaurants, bars, gift shops, hiking, athletic experiences, all kinds of activities that can be done in an environment that pretty much stays 80 degrees year round. And I'm talking about the air temperature and the water temperature. So it is, I mean, it truly is nature's playground. And as a Marine Max opportunity, we bring people there and deliver the same level of experience and professionalism and provide that peace of mind that someone from Ohio that's never seen a wave or never seen a seagull can go down and just have an absolutely wonderful experience. So that was sort of the, the concept um, and the birth of Marine Max Vacations. Over the years, it's expanded. We have partnerships around the globe where we can offer similar experiences in the Pacific Northwest, down in Australia, over in Europe, 
even over here in the Bahamas, just off Florida's coast. So we offer those experiences around the globe, but but truly the BVI is our is our headquarters for that activity. We have a fleet of about 40 boats there that are available, as I said, for self-driving if you qualify, or take a skipper if you don't want to handle the helm, or if you'd like, we can put a, a captain and a chef on board for a completely new level of experience. So that's my long answer to your quick question. <laughs> So, so you just you just mentioned some there. So, some guy from Michigan that you know you says is not going to be familiar with the saltwater aspect of it and what to expect when they get down there. They're going to get an orientation, right? So, I mean, if they, if they've got some sort of prior decent sized big boat experience, they're still going to be able to take that forty four or forty eight a kilo out on their own. Absolutely, there, there's a vetting process. Uh, we ask for a boating resume. We review that resume to see what the experience level is of our charter guests. Then we'll have a conversation with them about areas that we may be concerned with. For the most part, if you've been uh, competent in operating a boat of similar size, say plus or minus three feet, uh, if you've run twin engines, if you know how to use a GPS, you know those are the sort of things that we're looking to confirm. With that confirmed, then yes, you'd qualify as, a, as an operator. We would give you a, a link to a YouTube video well in advance. We have a whole series on our YouTube channel of educational videos that will allow you to learn how to run the windlass, run the water maker, turn on and off the generator. We try to make that experience as, um, as good as we can for somebody because we recognize that it's your first time stepping on a completely different, and to you, to you it's a foreign vessel. So we try to make you aware and familiar with all that long before you ever go down. And when you do arrive, assuming you've watched all those videos, it'll be very, very comfortable for you. In addition, we have local briefing agents that'll get on the boat. They will walk through all of the systems with you, make sure you understand how to operate them all, answer questions. They even take you out of the marina to make sure that you're comfortable and competent in operating the boat. Sometimes it is needed and, and we're happy to do it where we'll leave a, one of our skippers on the boat for half a day or a couple hours or whatever is needed to, to let the guest feel comfortable with the operation. So we're very careful to make sure that you have a great experience, both for your own enjoyment and protection, but also for ours, because we want to protect the assets that we have in the fleet. <laughs> right. So you mentioned about the boats and the BVIs and, and let, let's talk about the actual boats for a minute. So Keith and I are both, you know, when we're working out of, you know, Clearwater and St. Pete, we're extremely, familiar with Aquila power catamarans and that brings us to the point of today's episode so <laughs> you guys are chartering the Aquila power cats whether it's a 44 48 36 or even some bigger models that we'll we'll talk about in a minute um let's talk about the actual boat so i guess first of all what is a catamaran and and what does that actually mean so great question because the word catamaran may be foreign to somebody, but in the in the boating climate, you know, the catamaran is an indication that the boat's going to have multiple sponsons. Uh, catamaran would be two sponsons or two independent hulls connected by a bridge. That's a design that has been around for thousands of years. I mean, really, if you go back to some of the ancient civilizations and you look at pictures of dugout canoes, a lot of them have a second sponson because it's very easy to see that that gives the, the boat a lot more stability. So when you move to a catamaran, you're able to operate on a more slender hull since you have two of them bridged by the deck. That makes the boat much more efficient through the water. It adds a tremendous amount of stability because of that, that footprint or that width, if you will, that's allowing the boat to, to stay in position. And then when you consider all of the square footage that that creates, it makes an ideal uh, vessel for comfort and luxury on board because you get so much more square footage. Did that answer your question, Nick? Absolutely. For sure. It's uh, you know, catamarans, I've, I've said this for a while now, you look at all these other places around the world, you look at a country like South Africa, you look at Australia and stuff like that. All you see is catamarans. And, and, I, and I've said it now for a couple of years, I think that give it 10 years down the road for the most part, you're going to see a lot more, major hull manufacturers at least have, whether it's a line of catamarans or whatever it may be, we're already seeing it. You know, we're, uh, as far as pros and cons go in the old days, I'll say it. I mean, catamarans were ugly. They were, but now, I mean, you've got these sleek catamarans coming out and, you know, you get all those advantages like the square footage, the ride, the stability and all that stuff. And, 
And you're, you're, I think you're definitely going to see it more and more, you know, as, as we make our way into the future. So Keith, what are your thoughts on that from, you know, running a lot of Aquilas and other catamarans too? Oh, I, I, I a hundred percent agree. And, you know, you're seeing more and more, you know, of them out on the water. Um, you know, a lot of it too. I mean, it, high and dry storage, you might be a little bit limited on who can, who can pick your boats up and who can, who can store them. So whether you have to have a cradle made or uh, something else, which we can, you know, talk about on how they can, you know, safely handle your boat. But I found that the catamaran click, the, that group of boaters is very, very passionate about the catamarans. And um, like, you know, you got the Boston Whaler group, right? I mean, the Boston Whaler people are, are Boston Whaler do or die. Oh, yeah. And the same thing with a lot of these people with it, you know, whether it's, you know, the Freemans or the, the the twin V power cats or whatever they are. I mean, there's, there's more and more manufacturers, tons of them coming out now. You know, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I don't know if it's the best analogy, but I liken it to the shift we saw in the automotive world. If you think back 20 years ago, everybody was driving a two door or a four door or a station wagon. And the whole concept of an SUV didn't exist other than maybe the old Jeep, uh, whatever the Jeep was or the, the suburban. But today, when you look at how SUVs have taken over, and in some cases there are factories that don't even build two-door, four-door cars any longer, they just build SUVs because the public realizes it makes so much sense. And I think that's the logic that's taking hold with catamarans right now. People realize they don't have to buy as long a boat to get so much more space. They don't have to add extra fixtures like sea keepers or foils that are on the outside or anything to, to create stability because the catamaran gives them that stability. They find that they can take a lot more people and have a social area that's really conducive to spending time together. I think people are just seeing the catamarans make more and more sense and that's part of that growth. Yeah, I think so too. And you know, we always, I, I get the question in sales a lot too, like, all right, Nick, come on, what's the downside of this boat? And you know, the first thing that's gonna come to mind and, and the first thing that's obvious is like Keith brought up before too, storage whether it's at a high and dry or whether it's in a marina especially on these big cats but what what i found is you are seeing more and more marinas accommodate you're yep. seeing more and more t docks and stuff like that and from planning a number of trips whether it's on the west coast of florida between here and the keys with a little bit of planning you know a catamaran and, and you know that beam and stuff i've never knock on wood yet I've never ran into any issue where I've been like, oh man, if I was in a mono hall, I would able, I would have been able to find, you know, dockage there. I haven't encountered it, so I don't think is it's as big of a deal as a lot of people might think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, we hear it. We hear it when people are beginning the process of shopping. Yeah. We hear that that they say, oh, where am I going to park this thing? And I think the reality, to your point, is there are sea walls, there are T heads. I've seen a number of marinas that are happy to pull a finger to have a brand new boat come into that marina because yeah. they realize that, you know, the, the revenue will be similar to the marina and they're, yep. they want to upgrade the, the inventory in their marina to, to newer, bigger, better boats. Cause I, I think they realize people will use them more frequently and use the services of the marina. It's a good point. Great point. I know like even you guys down at St. Pete have done that too, for, you know, certain boats, you're going to get somebody in there and you, you're going to make, you know, you make some moves, you do some things, and juggle some stuff around. A lot so it absolutely makes sense. And a lot of the boats that are in that 36 and down, I, I see them going on lifts because that lift is really not any more complicated for a 32 or 36 foot catamaran than yeah. oh, no. for a 36 foot center console. Yeah, no, no. Boat lifts are, that's, it's simple. It's easy. Yeah. Stick it, stick it between the pipes and hit the up button. <laughs> yep. yeah. Looks hey, like we got some good questions yeah. rolling in here. So, there um, go. uh, let's see, let's, We'll come back to Lisa Love's uh, question here. because Christian Lim is on here. He goes, on a shallow great lake such as Lake Erie, how does the cat perform with short, choppy, sawtooth waves? The vast majority of boats here are mono hauls only. That's a good question. Yeah, excellent question, Christian. And Lake Erie, uh, my familiarity was down in the bottom left corner uh, coming out of Catawba Island, Port Cure, and down in that area of Lake Erie um, and traveling around to those islands. So – in that type of condition, I think what you'll find is that the faster, and I'm not recommending you drive excessive speed, but the faster you go with a catamaran, oftentimes the softer the ride becomes. You get the advantage of 
capturing some air between the two hulls underneath the bridge deck. It's that area is known as the tunnel. And that tunnel actually can build up an air pocket or an air cushion. And maybe you've seen that in some of the racing catamarans, but that does tend to soften that ride a little bit. And then the next part that you're looking at is how the construction of the two hulls are. And if the hulls have proper, uh, you know, if it's a symmetrical hull, it'll have a lot of lift, meaning both sides are even. And if they add the, the proper strakes or lines in the hull, that'll generate that extra lift. So what you tend to see with the catamaran is that it rides very level and the transition from being at rest to on plane, there's no, there's no different change in pitch. The boat typically builds up lift and it starts to rise flat and level. And so whether it's chop or the rolling, the rolling seas like we see in the Pacific Ocean, the catamarans perform incredibly well. I had a I had a sea trial with Raul here last week. You know, we had that little mini front came through, and Keith, you know how it gets when it when it cranks in Boca Ciega Bay. It's not like you're going to see any huge waves, but that chop when it beats off the seawall at PYCC there. I mean, it, it gets pretty choppy. We came around that corner. It's a washing it's, machine. It, it is, and just like you said, Dave, you get up to speed. You know, you're doing you know 25 knots or something like that on a kilo 36, and you're on top of the waves you're pretty much handling it the same way. I mean, it, it feels essentially the same as if you were running in flat, calm seas. When you're on top of it, that beam's so wide, you're talking a power catamaran, it's wide enough to bridge it between the waves. And, and it does, just like you said, it likes being there. And even on a 44, I mean, Keith, all these transports that we'll do between the boat shows and stuff like that, you know, you when, when you start talking about these bigger diesel power catamarans, you're planing, you know, some of them might have bulbuses and stuff like that. And, and you really are experiencing like a lot of people in these monohulls are putting seat keepers in. Okay. And mm -hmm. I find it's the same effect with the power cat. You know, you're just eliminating all that side to side rolling. So it's uh they, they do definitely love to ride on top of the waves. Yeah. One of, one of the best analogies I've seen, uh, I'll use my folder, but if you think about a monohull, you know, it's, it's a V, right? So you've mm -hmm. got this V hull and the keel would be underneath it at the center, but the boat is constantly seeking to find a balance point if you have a monohull. So you get this motion, whether you're at rest or underway, because it's constantly seeking to find balance. If you look at a catamaran and you look at how those forces are applied in a catamaran, this is the structure. You have two hulls that are sitting out of, apart from each other that create this stance. Sort of like if you stood up and, and I asked you to spread your legs three feet apart and stand, you're in a much stronger position to be knocked over than if I had you put your feet together. Like and that's that. really the beauty of driving a catamaran in any sea condition is that its footprint or its stance on the water is so much more firm and predictable that it makes for a much more comfortable ride. That predictability is the part that I find helps people that, that get motion sickness. The fact that they have more predictability for whatever reason in their head, it seems like it makes their equilibrium easier to maintain, mm -hmm. and you don't see as much motion sickness when people are on catamarans. That was a great display. I like that. Yeah, I I might like, steal like that, that one. I might steal that <laughs> one from you here in the future. You know, it, I've done it so many times, but it, it, it's just so common. It makes sense. So yeah. common sense when you think about it. All right, we got Lisa Love nine thousand here with it with another good question. Nick, do you see more power or sail cats in those places like South Africa, Australia, et cetera? That might be a good question for Justin Lindhorst to answer if he's watching this. So, Justin, if you're watching, why don't you drop that in the comments? But anyway, you know, you look at these pictures and stuff from you know different countries around the world, and it and it and it looks weird to us. I mean, you know those boots I'm talking about, all those little small catamarans that these people take out in these huge seas, whether it's 20, 25 feet. And you know, it does, it looks funky to us. It, it, it goes against the grain of what we think. And then you look at, you know, those charter fleets and stuff like that. And you know, the Caribbean and primarily for a long time there, it was pretty much sail cats only until power cats came on the scene. And uh, I think that the whole power catamaran thing really, really changed the way that it was. And, and I'm sure that you can speak on that, Dave. And that kind of leads me into another question here from Vito. Thanks for joining us again, Vito. How about sleeping quarter ability on a catamaran? Not familiar. And, and this is one of the things that I love. And we're going to hit on the Aquila 70 here in a minute in the upcoming debut. But, you know, walking all these big mono hulls, you know, these 85 footers, these these 90 footers and, and their big boats, their beautiful boats. But 
one thing that I think is often overlooked is these sleeping quarters on these catamarans. For the most part, you're not sharing a wall with anybody. You're you're hulls apart. You're literally on the other side of the boat with 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 a whole bunch of blank real estate down there separating you. Even when you're on these big mono hulls, you're sharing a wall with somebody. So for privacy's sake, that's something that I didn't realize for a while is you're you really can't beat that on any type of mono hull, no matter how big it is. So that's that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And you know, from a hull design standpoint, um, the Aquilas are somewhat unique, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But preceding that, if you think about the development of catamarans, you talked about the charter fleets in in the Caribbean, and it is clear that sailing catamarans have taken over that industry. There are still a few monohulls that are in place, but just from my Personal experience, I would say that sail cats probably are five to one over monohulls in the Caribbean charter fleets. They just offer so much more livability. And as you say, privacy and, and so many of the other benefits we've already talked about. If I'm gonna speak specifically about Aquila's uh, power catamarans, they are not sailboat thinking. They are not sailboat construction. They're not sailboat design. So in sailboat design, you're trying to reduce drag and make the boat as slender as possible. In the case of Aquila, they're trying to create lift. And in order to do that, it requires additional width to create the planing surface on the bottom of the hulls. When you create width on the exterior of the boat, what do you create on the inside of the boat? Massive space. space. And so the staterooms inside the, the hulls of the power catamarans are six and a half foot headroom. They're eight to 10 feet wide. These are the, the smaller cabins. I'll get to the master in a minute. So they have huge hull side windows. So you don't feel like you're down in, in a hull. They have skylights over top. They have tons of storage. So the, the extra width that we're talking about in, in an Aquila power catamaran gives you the buoyancy that the boat can get up and run like a power boat should, not a converted sailing hull. But the benefit of livability is you get tremendous space inside these boats. Now, if we move to the front and you look at some of the design innovation that Aquila has, they've actually connected the two with a bridge deck. You know, I talk about the two hulls being connected. They've actually placed a cabin across the front of this bridge deck. So you start with a king size bed in the middle. I mean, it's bigger than some bedrooms that, that are in homes being built today. And you park a, a galley, I'm excuse me, you park a head over on one side and you park storage and, a, and a closets on the other side. In some of our boats, that's a 24 foot wide bedroom in the front. And to your point, Nick, that doesn't share a common wall. So that this is privacy, it's spectacular. It makes access from the main deck of the boat super easy. Um, it really, if you haven't seen these boats, getting online, go to aquilaboats.com or marinemaxvacations.com and explore these boats because the power catamarans that are built for our purposes, uh, they, they're just, they are truly innovative. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there, there's a lot that goes on there besides, you know, a lot of these power cat hulls that will just be repurposed, you know, sailboat, sail cat hulls too. I mean, for instance, on Aquila. I don't know if we hit on the wave breaker down the center yet. That does make mm -hmm. a very big difference, especially in the rough seas at high speeds. I mean, you're not just taking a mast off of one of these boats. And, and, and you do notice it when you're trying to keep everybody comfortable and get where you're going, especially when it's not so nice. But uh, anyway, with that uh, with that being said, we'll, we'll hit on some more Aquila stuff in a minute. I see we have a featured question down below from Brian Drapp. It says, all right, all right, let's go. This might hey, be hey, good. Uh, what's that? Do we, did, I know we, we had a question about boating on Lake Erie, and I talked about the chop. Do we want to talk about the draft? Because that was one of the comments was the shallowness of, of the lakes. I, I think that's another important point about catamarans over monoholes, because we talked about that V hull. That V hull mm -hmm. is a lot deeper in the water before it generates the, you know, the, the weight carrying capacity. When you spread that out to two hulls, you're in essence sitting less deep in the water. So the boats are shallower. And some of the bigger ones, actually, they bring the prop up in a tunnel. So they tuck the prop mm -hmm. up inside the hull. So you end up with a, a much shallower draft and the ability to go into some coves, up on some beaches. So there's some other shallow water. There's some very big benefits to having a catamaran over a monohull. Yeah, and I think it, it might be a common misconception as well that, like, okay, hey, 
you know, if a boot is going to draft less, then it's not going to be as stable. But, you know, obviously on a Catabran, that's not the case. So right. you're, in a, you're in a more stable platform. You're drawing less water. And, you know, especially in places where draft is an issue, it, it does make a big difference. So, yeah, I just um, yeah, that's a good point, Dave. I didn't want to ignore that part of his question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Keith, I think we got a question for you here from Brian Drapp. If the man behind the curtain can pull that up on the screen there, it says, let's say, for example, I have to drive through some large rollers with this set and a V haul. One just drives up one side and turns hard over and drives down the other side. What is this procedure for doing this with a cat? Are there any differences? You know, let's talk, uh, you know, these catamarans and rollers, Keith. So what I've found is they take them really, really well. Um, you'll come up, but then as that boat starts to go down on the other side, you, you know, you're spread out, you got the beam and, and it really does just kind of cushion the blow. It's not, you're not kind of rolling up and you get that big pitch like Dave was showing with his notebook, uh -huh. you got the V versus, so you're going to be rolling a lot and then versus, you know, you're spread out. So, um, going over the, the big rollers, the short chop, it, they perform marvelous. You know, Nick, to that point with, um, with boats that employ the bulbous bow, um, whether it be a large monohull or a power catamaran, the bulbous bow can play a role there as well because it's increasing the buoyancy at the front. So the, the front of the boat tends to not dive mm -hmm. as deep into the rolling sea. That's whether you're going into or following seas. So the bulbous bow also helps to aid in making that boat easier to control through those situations. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about, about the bulbous bows as well. I mean, I think that one of the things that you'll see on other power cats that, you know, you'll hear people complain, you know, about bow steering situations in a following sea. And mm -hmm. whereas Aquila kind of revolutionized that, I mean, you see it on the big boats, but I mean, for instance, when you guys started doing it on the 44s, besides the obvious with the buoyancy and stuff like that and you know some of the smaller performance what went into your thought process basically from the charter standpoint too with the bulbous bows and because it is it's funky when a lot of people see them they'll see a bird standing or a turtle sitting on it in front of in front of where the hull comes into the water it's like hey what the heck am i looking at yeah so the first the first question that people ask us when they're looking at it on the dock you know getting ready to go on charter is Hey, I noticed that that sticks out. Am I, do I need to worry about bumping into a mooring ball? Will that break off? Is that, you know, and they, they are designed in the construction process to be somewhat sacrificial. They can be separated from the bow of the boat without damaging the integrity of the hull. Um, so that, that answers that question. That's just forward thinking that we, we know that that's the possibility, especially in charter, there's that possibility that someone may get uncomfortable, may bump a, a mooring ball because they don't, they don't know quite the space of the boat. It's not like when you own your own boat, you get a sense of how yeah. big it really is, right? So from that standpoint, they're sacrificial and they can be, you know, literally affixed back on with fiberglass and epoxy. The, um, from, a, from a handling standpoint, the, the biggest benefit that I see is, is it takes the pitch out of the boat when the boat is going in either up or down the wind you tend to want to climb up and then fall over a wave. And when the boat wants to fall over a wave, without that added buoyancy in the front, the boat will dive deeper into the water. When it dives deeper, it decelerates. So it slows mm -hmm. down, which is uncomfortable for passengers on board. It also has a tendency to throw more spray up on the deck if it's diving down deeper in the water. And of course it becomes harder to, to manage from a captain standpoint. By adding the bulb to the bow, you remove a lot of that because as the boat comes down, I use the analogy of a basketball. You ever try to take a ball and push it under the water, you realize how much resistance that inflated ball has. It's not the air in the ball, it's the displacement. That ball mm -hmm. just down. And that's exactly the same principle that's taking place when you're coming down off of a wave. So, so that's the first big benefit of adding the bulbous bows to the boats. And you do see it on much larger boats. You see it on freighters. You see it on mega yachts. A yeah. kilo is able to scale that down into the, the appropriate size for a 44-foot boat. But the second thing is, is more hydrodynamics. And this is outside of, of my knowledge. But I know that it, it reduces 
the drag at the bow. So it's improving our performance from a from a fuel efficiency standpoint. It's able to reduce the drag. And, and again, I don't know if that's because it doesn't create the little eddy circles of drag around the entry point. It's yeah. It's came out. Um, but if you look at the test results with and without, it's significantly improved having the, the bulbous bows in the front of the boats. Yeah, I think somehow uh, somehow your answer your answer yeah. there, Dave, just went perfect into uh, Michael Bozarth just came up here on uh, YouTube and was yeah um, he owns a 2020 Aquila 44, loves everything about the layout, haven't experienced it yet, but have been warned about taking a large C on my stern or off my stern quarter. Because can you talk about the boat's behavior under these conditions? And that's kind of just what you just you know you walked us through there. Yeah, and I think if I remember correctly, Mr. Bozarth is a West Coast uh, Pacific Ocean boater, so he's probably dealing with oh, water wow. seas. And um, so you can get some of that surfing effect on those on those longer on those longer waves. Um, and, and there is a bit of an of a push. It's no different than the push you're going to get in a monohull, in the sense that if a following sea picks up the tail of your boat and starts to push on it, you have to be ahead of it on the helm or it'll, it can surprise you. I think that can happen on any boat. But to your point earlier, Keith, that the footprint being wider, it is more stable. So you don't feel yourself getting pitched as much as you do in a monohull. And my, my recommendation is not to run on autopilot, but instead manually drive the boat when you're in those conditions, just because you'll be able to sense it and, and sort yeah. of predict it. You kind of get that rhythm of what the sea timing is, and you'll just offset your steering in, in the right timing to counter it. And I think you'll be fine. So good. Yeah, it's a, let's see. Oh, all right. William Edwards. Hi, Nick. I have a 36 on order with Justin with the hydrofoil. What speed can I expect with the 300 Mercury? So, uh, congrats, Mr. Edwards. You're, you're gonna, you're gonna be very happy. I actually was burning a midnight oil last night and I came across an awesome, awesome boat test.com video with captain Steve. And there's a strikingly handsome guy in the passenger seat. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and he's got all those specs laid out. He, if I remember correctly on his test, which, which was right here in Boca Ciega Bay, it was, uh, I think he hit like 44.6 top end. And um, he, he goes over in depth, just, you know, th the top end's great and everything like that, you know, on a foil, like, yeah, you're getting a, you're getting a greater top end speed with, you know, the less horsepower engines. But I mean, a real advantage to it, Bill, is, is you're, you're gaining almost, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave or Keith, but 30% fuel economy at cruise because you're, you're bumping it up to look like 1.3. So in theory, you're increasing your range that much more too. So you're, it, I, this is what I always talk about with the hydrofoil. If you are planning on doing those long trips, um, th there is some advantages there with the, you know, increased range. And the top end is great too. You definitely notice the top end. The boat is going to handle a little bit differently, more specifically when you get up on plane and when you turn. But uh, yeah, check out that boattest.com video. They did a, they did a good job. So I was I was watching it last night. It's been out for about a week. It's it it's an amazing it's an amazing addition to an already good running hull. Mm -hmm. That part that's so striking is you know the thirty six Aquila. They've sold well over a hundred of those boats without oh, yeah. the foil. Yeah. And when you add the foil, it changes as you say. It changes the dynamics of the boat slightly, but the improvement in the fuel efficiency is staggering. I mean, a thirty percent improvement. There are people that spend thousands of dollars fine tuning props and changing balance points to try to get a couple miles an hour and a couple more gallons per hour. And right. it's just amazing how that levels that boat off and cuts the, cuts the fuel consumption. Let's see, you got Michael Bozart, Michael Bozart there. So he's expecting a yaw movement or a yaw. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Sort of predicting. You get the timing of the roller, and you just sort of know when to put some counter pressure against the rudders, and then relieve that pressure, and the boat will the boat will stay true to your to your course. Let's see. Let's, let's who we miss here? Question from Brian here, guys. Uh, featured question right there. 
Got Brian's asking, what about the storage? Is there a difference versus the V-Hauls? Well, I mean, the obvious the obvious answer that ran through my head is, well, there's twice as much because there's two hulls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there, there is. There is so much more square footage uh, in the footprint that it just naturally has more storage. So if I was you know, trying to analyze, uh, I mean, a lot of us look at a 44-foot Aquila and we say, wow, you'd have to be on a 65-foot boat to have this much space. If you look at the 54 Aquila, most people say, am I not supposed to talk about that, Nick? Oh, go for it, man. Okay. Let it rip. They look at 54 Let it rip. Say, oh, this boat's got as much storage as an 80 foot boat. So that kind of gives you a, a reference, you know, and I would say on a 36, it'd be equal to being on a 45 foot monohull. So I think there is more storage because we can take advantage of all that space across the bridge deck, you know? Yeah. It, it, it almost ruins it for some monohulls when, you know, you're on a, you know, you talk about a 50 foot mono hall and then a, a 50 foot Aquila 54, for instance. And like, man, like you literally would be looking at 70 footers to get the same square mm -hmm. footage. So we've got a question up here, Carson Cole, how about the cost right. comparison cost per square foot comparison? Seems like mono holes are a lot less expensive, particular for smaller groups. Exactly. So let's, let's talk about the total square footage there for a second. Uh, that's a great question, Carson. And if it's more expensive, okay, it, it is almost like apples to apples. And now for smaller groups, you know, private groups, it might be a little different situation, but it's almost like apples to oranges when you're talking about, okay, how come this 45 footer is going to charter for X amount, but this 45 foot or 44 foot catamaran is going to charter for this amount so much more. And, you know, even considering it might even have the same amount of staterooms. Let's talk about the square footage of a boat. Let's talk about everybody not being on top of each other. Let's talk about that privacy in the staterooms like we talked about before, not getting claustrophobic and not hating everybody else on a boat after a few days. Um, if you want to elaborate a little bit on that, just as far as, you know, what justifies that increased cost from a charter revenue standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, that's a very fair question. We get asked that a lot, especially when we see the migration of people coming from sailboats to powerboats in the charter world. But if you think about uh, a catamaran, you know, every time we move a foot wider, we're also adding 44 feet. So every foot wider is another 44 feet of square footage, just in basic terms. So it's an exponential growth. It's not like you can say a 40 and a 44. No, when you go from a 40 monohull to a 44 catamaran, it's exponential. Mm -hmm. So cost per square footage on a boat purchase standpoint, um, there is just so much more when you look at a catamaran. You're looking at a, a wider living room, a wider galley, a wider bedroom of the fly bridge. The fly bridge is wider. The foredeck is wider. So you just you're getting so much more in the, in a similar size length that it's it is going to be more expensive. When you look at it as cost per square foot, I haven't done that math. I, I venture to say it might be less in a cost per square foot, just because you know, you're, you're getting more efficient. Yeah. I mean, from a, from a purchasing standpoint, if we want to feature Lito's or Vito Lucci's question down there, uh, cost, please compare purchase costs. What's the difference? Okay. Yeah. There's, there's not an increase in the cost and you know, you're, you're almost, I don't want to say doubling. I'd have to do the math on it, but as far as the square footage of what you're getting, your cost per square foot to buy is going to be less. Wouldn't you guys agree? I, I would think so. Uh, you may be, so if you looked at a similar size monohull, it might yeah. be slightly more to buy a, a catamaran. Right. But if you look at cost per square foot, I believe it will be a, a lower number. Mm -hmm. Let alone all the square footage you get, but just think about the ease of handling uh, with these oh, yeah. cats, right? The engines are set out so wide, so far apart. I mean, you don't need to have the joystick. You don't need to have bow thrusters. You don't, and there's a lot of stuff, the costs that you can cut out that you might want to have on a monohull boat to be able to do that with this, with them, with them out wide like that. I mean, it's, you know, into forward, pour it into reverse, and you're just going to sit there and spin and you can walk that thing sideways. You can do anything you want with it. That is a great point, Keith. And especially in the charter world where people are, first time on this boat and they're looking around and they're not familiar with everything. It is so comforting when they realize, wait a sec, these big brass propellers driven by powerful Volvo diesels are 21 feet apart 
Yep. I got some power to move that boat. And all of a sudden they get very comfortable driving this, this big power catamaran. I can parallel park an Aquila 44, but I can't parallel park my, my truck. So, so there you go. That's uh, well, well, and then think about it like, well, going through a bridge, right. And you got yeah. a lot of current or you got a lot of wind and you're sideways to stuff. You know, that steering wheels doesn't do you a lot of good at low speeds, mm -hmm. but you can increase the, the RPMs and accelerate and make that boat walk and maneuver right on through there. I mean, it's just, there's just so much torque and the dis distance between everything to make that boat do what you want to do. Yeah. And then Keith, I want to touch on you. You mentioned charter rates. So like in the charter market, a lot of the rate is driven by the cost of the, the boat itself, right? So if an, a, an owner that's in our fleet that owns one of the boats will have invested a certain amount of capital for that boat. The, the boats have large engines, you know, that I mentioned they're Volvo diesel engines. They have water makers, they have oversized generators. They have microwaves, cooktops. I, I can go on down a long list of features, but a lot of those features are more robust in a power catamaran than they would be in a, a comparable monohull or a sailing catamaran. As a result, they do add to the cost. And that's where I come back to say it's probably slightly more expensive than uh, a similar monohull will be. In the charter market, there's a business element that says, hey, we have to rent that boat out at a certain rate that generates enough return to cover our costs of operations. And so when you look at a, a brand new Aquila in our fleet, it is gonna be more expensive to rent. But I, again, it's sort of like our conversation about the square footage. What you're getting for that rental dollar, you're getting all this luxury, all this reliability, the peace of mind, the quality of the build, and all of the features that are on it. So I, I think your dollar goes farther and you get a better experience, even though your price per charter you may pay a little more to to charter an Aquila with Marine Max Vacations than another brand from another company. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously pro vacations, but I, I I don't think my position is not justified either. I, I I just have seen it too too many times where people step on the boat and they are absolutely blown away. They're just blown away by the thickness of the glass, the size of the windows, the amount of of um, uh, ceiling height inside, and you know the boat. I can go on and on and on. But oh just, yeah so much more than all the other charter boats that they've been on that they just they're taken they're taken back when they step on board yeah it, it'll turn you into a boat snob really quick <laughs> yeah. yeah so we, while we have a few more minutes here let's talk about something that has been pretty making a very big presence literally on social media. And I'm talking about, of course, we have the Palm Beach Boat Show coming up here next or this weekend. And there is a massive reveal at that show. It is the Aquila 70 launch. The Aquila 70 has been something that has been part of our lives for well over, I mean, a year or two or even more now. And just, you know, through the renderings, through the pictures, through the secret reveals, through the sneak peeks, and to seeing it in person and to finally being a part of the world debut, it's it's going to be big. So so I guess we could kind of hit on that a little bit. All three of us have seen it. All three of us have been on it. Um, what what should we expect from, from that debut? And, and, and how is that particular yacht going to change the world of catamarans even further? A great question and a wonderful lead up. So... You know, Aquila's got a foundation of performance, quality, and innovation. And if those are the measuring points, the Aquila 70 absolutely knocks it out of the park on every one of those points. Um, if you want to look at innovation, the boat has uh, it has an, an operating system that was developed in partnership with Volvo Penta to be a joystick, hydraulic bow thrusters, thousand horsepower engines. The the boat is so sensitive to the joystick touch that it literally responds instantly when you make a command. The boat will run top speed up near 30, 32 miles an hour. It is incredibly smooth transitioning through all of its paces. It's equipped with interceptors to adjust ride control, both in terms of its bow and stern elevations, but also its left and right trim. So if you're in a condition where you've got a a heavy side crosswind, or if maybe one of your tanks is lighter than the other, or you're carrying 
something weird in the way of, uh, you know, weight on the boat, you can adjust left and right. The boat has amazing innovation built into it. The dinghy slipway on the back is a ramp system that allows the dinghy to pull into its own garage. The dinghy itself, custom built specifically by Aquila, it's a catamaran style tender. It's a, you know, a Hypalon 17 foot, 14 foot tender side console, center console, tucks up in the garage, it's beautiful. Uh, the innovation on the boat is, is really amazing. The space inside the boat, when you step inside, that you were talking about a 27 foot wide living room. It's just, it's like a condo on the water, literally on the water. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is spectacular. And then we talked about the space in the, in the living room. You know, that master, master cabin is at 27 feet. It runs from hull to hull on the, uh, in the bow of the boat. The styling is like a super yacht. It's just absolutely beautiful styling. And when you go through the boat and you look at the quality of the build, you go in the engine compartment and you see the wire looms and you see how everything is, is you know, double clamp, toast clamps, everything is marked, everything is laid out. It, it is flawless. It is absolutely flawless. And it truly is, I think, the icon for Aquila being the most successful power catamaran builder on the globe right now. They really have set a standard that is going to be difficult for anyone to catch. I think that this whole point, you know, not, not to take away from any of the other highly, highly successful Aquila models, but Aquila made this 70, right? And they, and they brought a great team around this whole project. And, and what they did, they made a statement. And by making that statement, they flexed their muscles with everything, saying, hey, this is what we're about. We belong here, and we're meant to stay. From the the joystick system, which works fantastic. I've driven it myself. The walk-in engine room, the fit and finish, the custom Italian furniture, the way the boat performs. You're up in that, you're up in that bridge there. You go out, you're going 30 miles per hour. You don't even know that you're going that fast. Every mm -hmm. little thing is not like you've seen on any of the other big power catamarans. This is, I mean, it truly did. I mean, it, it's going to revolutionize the whole mold. And uh, I, I just, I can't wait to show people it. I can't wait to be aborted. I can't wait for everything to be out in the open and then uh, really see these take off, whether it's, you know, in the States to Caribbean or all over the world. So um, keep your eyes peeled. We've got a big reveal. Keith, what are your thoughts on the boat from spending a little bit of time on it? And, and what's one of those things to look for oh, when, the debut? It just, it just blows you away. You know, when we had the kind it of a sneak peek down there, down there at the St. Pete store with uh, Nick also had his 54 Aquila down there, which was haul number one, first one delivered here in the United States. And his clients took delivery of it. They just got back from Key West. Um, so we had a nice christening ceremony and, and stuff for them. It was a nice party. But they also had the 70, you know, there. And, I mean, what a showstopper. You can't even, you can't, you know, Dave just described it and you guys did. But, you know, if, if you got the chance, if you're at West Palm Beach for the, for the official grand opening, if you can get on this boat and see this, you know, it's just, it's phenomenal. It's, it's unbelievable. All right, got time for a couple other questions here. I appreciate that, Keith. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. I'll let you guys take this one. How does a high-performance piercing bow differ from a bulbous bow? Um, Dave, I think you might have hit on that a little earlier when we got in depth with the bulbuses. Yeah, so without a little more clarification on the question, I don't want to step off the wrong, uh, the wrong direction. Yeah. When you talk about wave piercing, versus bulbous, I think the difference would probably be just simply sort of like a tip of a spear entry point. So there may be a little less resistance on the entry point, but I don't know that it would give you the same level of flotation um, or the hydrodynamics to reduce the drag. But I, but I am not a naval architect, so you, you've exhausted my, uh, my, my knowledge. <laughs> All right, let's see. We got we got one other question here coming in over text saying catamarans. Is this a local or a global phenomenon? That's a great question. What are your thoughts on that? That is a great question. And I've had the pleasure of traveling the globe with Aquila, uh, representing at different boat shows around the world. And I will tell you, it, it is a global phenomenon. Um, and, and I don't know. I don't know why that is. Can't explain that because I think different parts of the 
the world have different applications or uses for their boats, but some of the common things are the benefits that we've talked about, the stability, the fuel efficiency, um, but absolutely you see it at, at all of the boat shows, whether it's Germany, whether it's in the Med, down in Australia, out in Asia, all the markets, you see a migration to catamarans and you see a migration to power catamarans. So that's exciting for Aquila because they truly are in that leading position and dominate that, that space with innovation and quality and performance. There are a lot of other brand name plates out there and some have been around for a while, but they typically are not stretching to grow with, with new ideas and new designs. And mm. I think that's, that's where Aquila has really set the, set the mark. They've really pushed the envelope out there. And it's going to be tough for competitors to, to rise up to the standard that Aquila is setting. It is for sure. And whether that's on the charter market or the private retail market, um, it is. It's uh, everybody else is going to be playing catch up. So maybe if the man or woman behind the curtain would drop those links in the comments there, um, how to get more information on a Marine Max vacation, also how to get more information on private purchase. Um, those links are going to be in the comments down below. And um, of course, you know, reach out to, you know, your local Marine Max for more information and we'll really get in depth, but um, looks like we're, we're running out of time here. But with that being said, what we like to do at the end of each episode is um, before we sign off, um, we asked Captain Keith, um, what kind of boats you're going to be delivering here this week and how many of those are uh, 320 Sundancers? No 320 Sundancers this week. <laughs> so I've got a 40, <laughs> let's see, I just got off a 345 Conquest that we we're getting ready for Saturday's delivery. I demoed a 38 hour age today with a uh, uh, family from West Palm. They came over here to run our 38. Uh, so we got the 42. We got a 285 Conquest going on Thursday, a 36 Aquila on Friday, and then that 345 Conquest on Saturday. So a big, big whaler week and uh, 36 Aquila. Cool. So, hey, we got one other quick. Well, we got stuff. a couple other questions said, on here, though, too, real quick. Oh. So. Uh, Firaz Khan, because I'm from Kenya. I have a 32 foot cat, 14 foot beam and a 200 Yamaha. Is that fine? Damn right. It is. You got a boat, you're running around, you're happy with it. Heck yeah, man. That's what it's all about. You know, one of the things, Nick, that I wanted to mention is how many people have utilized Marine Max vacations, the charter fleet in the BVI to go experience life on a catamaran to assist them in making that purchase decision. We have yep. seen all the time people that will come spend a week with us in the BVI, learn how to use the boat, see how the boat performs, realize, my gosh, this is an amazing boat for my type of boating. And then they'll return back to the States and connect with their local Marine Max store to make their purchase. So it's kind of a try before you buy, but it's a pretty good way to go vacation too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we got a good question here from Christian Lim. When would one not a tough one to choose answer. a foil on a 36 Aquila? We get this a lot, though. And what type of boating should I pass on with a foil? So, so why should I or why should I not put a foil on a 36? So interesting question. Yeah. Um, you know, the only, the, only negative, the only negative to the foil is if you're just in it for all-out speed. Quite frankly, then a foil may not be the best choice for you and just <clears throat> trying to gain more horsepower. But if you're looking for the right balance of horsepower, fuel efficiency, and speed, the foil is ideal. Um, so I get to answer the question, I would say only if you're looking for to be the all-out fastest guy on the water, then you, you don't necessarily want the foil. We use a semi-foiling system. And so if you continue to accelerate the foil would actually get to the point where it would start to have resistance from, from air because it would be on the surface of the water and it would no longer be as effective. So that would be the only time I could think a foil would not make sense. For every other application, uh, I think the foil is, is a brilliant solution. Good stuff. I mean, we get, we get that question a lot too. And I know Lex has a, has a video on youtube that really breaks down everything technically speaking you know from the naval architecture standpoint 
with the foil on a 36. So that's that's a good one. You it's one of the first ones that pulls up when you search the hydrofoil. But uh yeah, that's for um let's see. There's yeah. another, uh there's a YouTube out there uh as well from the designer of the foil whose name is Pete Melvin. He was very involved in the America's Cup, which if you're watching any of the you know current news, uh that's been underway and foiling has just taken over the sailing community in that yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like we got time for one more question here. We got Brian here that says, are you purchasing an Aquila for your new wife, Nick? Well, Brian, you're going to need to put that deposit down on that 70 and, and then, and then, <laughs> then we might be able to have that conversation. So, <laughs> um, so that's that. Not, not and a deposit. We got to deliver it. Yeah, that's the truth. So um, cool. Yeah. We got uh, an interesting opportunity here though. We, on the upcoming episode section, it says TBD, which means to be determined. So if you guys have any recommendations for an upcoming episode, we do read all these. Our uh, man behind the curtain reads all these too. If you have any guests that you recommend, any topics that you think that we haven't covered, drop them in the comments and we will listen and we will take it into consideration. So we'll uh, go ahead and, and keep an eye out for that. But with that being said, we're wrapping up the hour here. It's been an absolute pleasure, Dave, always an encyclopedia of catamaran knowledge. And, and we look forward to seeing what's next in the charter world, the catamaran world, the power catamaran world, and, uh, and just happy to be along for the ride. It's exciting times. So and thanks for letting me be part of your, uh, of your show today. Absolutely. You're welcome back anytime. Absolutely, man. I learned a lot, man. I love it. This hour flew by. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. It did. So. Keith, not not to outdo Captain Keith, it's been an honor as well. Always enjoy uh, being alongside you here and and learning from from one of the best, if not the best. And uh, I'm looking forward to next week. So if you want to sign us off, and we'll uh, we'll we'll hit the road. All right. Well, once again, thank you everybody. Thank you for your time. It's Captain Keith in Marine Max Clearwater, Nick in St. Pete, Dave Biggie up the road in Clearwater. Want to thank you guys for uh, 